my time. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending this session and for especially for staying on till the end. The session on quote uh, conceptual methodological innovations in the archaeology of early urbanism. And the jump off point of of my presentation is really the suspicion that in theorizing urbanism, archaeologists have created a mythological creature, perhaps a little bit like this one up here. And as you all know, such are characterized by two things. First, that they do not occur in real life. And second, that they tend to express ideas of which we're either a little too fond or fearful. The presentation uh, issues from a paper which was recently published in the wonderful and revolutionary double-blind peer-reviewed open access journal of urban archaeology, which has Manuel and myself on the board and to which you're all cordially invited to contribute. Uh, the ideas issue from my involvement in the Danish Center for Urban Network Evolutions. And what I will do is try and outline how the archaeology of places and societies that we call urban may be reconceptualized as expressions of social and material networks. David Wengrow uh, noted in his lecture on Friday how the archaeology of cities have been enrolled into what he calls state narratives. And I think that we can probably all recognize how that has happened in a lot in the literature. Uh, it's even been observed that when archaeologists say city, we often mean state. And the point I wish to make then is that when we mean to say city, we ought perhaps more often to say network. I wish to propose though that urbanism is not simply about networks, uh, but very mainly about a specific component of social networks that sociologists have called weak ties and which I think archeologists have uh, engaged far too little with. So the standard narrative about archaeology and urbanism is that archaeologists in the early 20th century, such as Max Uhle or Leonard Woolley, excavated lost ancient cities from ancient civilizations across the old and new worlds. And subsequently, theorists like Vera Gordon Child and Robert McCormick Adams figured out that these were a cross-culturally significant hallmark of human societies, which had reached a certain stage of development. This in turn led to the 43rd Theoretical Archaeology Group Conference in Edinburgh, and in the process uh, to uh, the theory of urban revolutions. We may want to say today that we uh, have gone beyond such ideas, but as Manuel reminded us in his opening address to the conference, uh, Charles' model is still the archaeology you are likely to encounter if you are studying cities as a social scientist and uh, or, or a, an urban planner. Now, a different and I think arguably more realistic background to the models that we have inherited about uh, what we call urbanism uh, can be gleaned from the, the social context of the researchers. Uh, I think the important point that we tend to forget is that uh, the whole discourse about urbanism uh, is rooted not in, originally in uh, the ancient world, but in something that happened in uh, North America and Europe, in particular in the late 19th century, when during the second, what's been called the second uh, industrial revolution, cities grew beyond recognition as industrial uh, and commercial metropoly. Um, this spectacular and very tangible uh, uh, change of uh, people's uh, life worlds was, uh, of course, both a great concern and, 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 and fascination for people in the period, nowhere more spectacular perhaps than in the transformation of Chicago, which has often been uh, sort of highlighted as, as uh, one of the marvels of that period. So cities became epitomized as economic and cultural uh, symbols of economic and cultural progress, and also uh, an object of concern since they seem to erode society as it was known. And that was really the background to the generation of scholarships which founded what became sociology. So people like Simula, Tonys, and Durkheim, and so, they analyzed this new uh, urban mass society. Their general concern was perhaps broadly humanity, but what they were specifically working with was industrial mass society. 
Then, as we all know, something happened. Uh, the, especially in Europe, uh, this new industrialized world, world uh, imploded into the First World War. And uh, in the aftermath of that, there was a general social uh, and specific social science uh, revaluation. What had got wrong, gone, gone wrong? What was it that this industrial society had lost in the process? And it's in this process that we find what became the classics of urban studies. Um, in America, the Chicago School that, uh, of, of well, urban ethnographers, in a way, went out to try and understand how urban society worked and what was, the, what was the, especially the detrimental sides of it. Um, in Europe, uh, liberals uh, such as, or relative liberals such as Weber or, uh, and Piren and the Annal School, who revisited uh, questions of civilization, but very much focused on uh, the city, uh, highlighting medieval cities and cities of the classical Greco Roman world, uh, which they knew from their training uh, as any. Uh, European of their age um, did. What they mounted was a criticism of urbanism, or really actually we might say today a criticism of cap capitalism, but it was, it was focused on uh, uh, cities as, a, uh, uh, as an inheritance of the, of the Industrial Revolution, really. This in turn, and I, depending on which tradition you are from, you're likely to recognize at least some of these as, as grand classics in the study of, of uh, what we call urban. But these became the, the, the uh, um, subtext for the next generation in, uh, after the Second uh, World War, who developed uh, this into a historical study. And that is where we find people like Ver Gordon Child or uh, the uh, medieval historian uh, Edith Annan or Schoberg or Adams uh, revisiting their historical fields based on inspirations from these sociological works. Um, and in the process, and that, I think that's the important thing, in the process actually, at the basic level, reverse engineering, a, a concept which had started out from an interest in industrial urbanism into history and trying to find the specific uh, point of origin or contrast for that concept. That is, and that's, that's historically why we have come to put such an emphasis on urbanism. There are also some alternative uh, views that tends to be picked up but tends to stay on the sideline like those, the wonderful uh, books by Wheatley or Jacobs. Um, it's based on this tradition that today we're engaged with this post-industrial critique, and I think say post-industrial because it has really come up in the context of our own uh, disengagement or uh, reconfiguration of industrial society. Uh, that's when we have started to question this inherited idea about cities as a unique uh, and definable core of social development. Um, and as expressed in, in uh, these and many other uh, works. In the process of that, as we've also seen today, we have begun to both to broaden the concept and to consider uh, situations in the past that were, not, that were previously not considered uh, to be urban, to try and, and broaden the boundaries and see that, see that as kind of expressions of the same things. And we're also, uh, uh, in some cases, um, questioned the whole idea that there is a specific thing that we can define as urban or what it is its, uh, its, its reason for being. Um, and we have seen how, in that process, uh, lots of places uh, uh, and new uh, realizations have have emerged, not, not just from this uh, rethinking, of course, uh, the, the, the new uh, sites and reconstructions that have, uh, some of which we have seen uh, during this morning's presentations and which crowd the literature on the subject now, are based on new modes of fieldwork, obviously, but they're also based on this wish to, to try and overcome uh, a an inherited mode of, 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 uh, of thinking about such places. Um, if we are to effectively try and establish something new that might 
fit all this new data and these new thinking. I think we need to return uh, to what defined it in the place and what better place to go than to Louis Wirt's uh, famous definition in 1938 of urban places being large, dense and heterogeneous permanent settlements. Um, and uh, I think it, we, we, we need to go back to the, uh, the idea that these three concepts are um, uh, overlapping, that uh, settlements, uh, settlement systems and political systems and uh, economic systems overlap so as to create a very definable uh, uh, unit called the city. And this is what I have tried to play with in uh, the paper that I mentioned, where I simply tried to uh, disengage Wirt's uh, four components uh, in, in a uh, mental map here to emphasize the mismatches between these categories. And this was really inspired by the discussion that's been in the last uh, years based on Roland Fletcher's idea of low density urbanism. And I thought if there can be a low density urbanism, which has size and heterogeneity, but not density, could there also be uh, uh, categories of low heterogeneity or low size urbanisms? And I think that that's actually quite a fruitful way of thinking about these sort of, but not quite urban uh, uh, places that we have discussed this morning and in, in, in uh, literature. So Roland Fletcher pointed to the Desicotta, uh, modern Desicotta, and um, uh, also to the ancient uh, sites such as, as Maya or, or the Khmer uh, settlements that he defines as low density uh, settlements. Um, Manuel uh, uh, pointed also to uh, some opida as expressions of that. Um, low heterogeneity is not a term that exists or existed before uh, this paper. Let's see if it gets alive. But it pretty accurately describes what uh, uh, people in the modern world have called aqua towns of very uh, uh, large and dense settlements that don't tend to uh, engender a lot of social differentiation. And I wonder if it also describes the mega sites that we have been concerned with this morning. Then finally, low size urbanism could be uh, a pretty accurate description of some of the weird places that archaeologists have been concerned with, uh, like monastic cities, trading emporia, or the Bronze Age citadels, which has the heterogeneity and are quite dense settlements, but do not quite fit the size. This could at least be a model to try and broaden the scene the way, way we have done already with the concept of low density uh, urbanism. But what I think is important also here is to move beyond the consistent focus on density and size, which has, has uh, um, been so outspoken in archaeology, and to consider this third part of Wirt's uh, uh, definition, the heterogeneity. That's what we have not been so uh, focused on and not been so good at, at uh, um, identifying in the record. Um, in doing so, and this is the last sort of major point I wanted to make, I think it could be fruitful to look at this concept of weak ties, which was defined by sociologist Mark Granovetta in back in the 1970s. Granovetta was working at the time uh, in survey studies of social networks, and his problem was how do people get information in their social system and con con uh, to, to make that specific. He studied how do people get a new job? How do they get to learn about a job opportunity that they, is then meaningful for them that becomes their new job? And what he found was that, uh, sort of to his surprise, that this was very rarely through a close friend. It was always through somebody, or tended to be through somebody that was not a close acquaintance, somebody who well, was at the sports club or... Uh, and uh, that's where he uh, coined this phrase, the weak ties as opposed to the strong ties, which is uh, things like kinship or, or long-term co-residency, and so that, that has been considered more important uh, in social network studies. And Granovetta pointed out that such people that you know very well are likely to meet the same or, or know the same cluster of people as yourself. And that's why the weak ties, the people who know somebody else, are really important. And uh, he made sure to distinguish that from absent ties, the kind of sort of 
non-important relations that has been associated with urbanism in some traditions. Uh, just nodding to the greengrocer or your neighbor, but not really knowing anything about it. Absence, uh, weak ties, actually, people we know quite well. We may know their families, we may dine together, but we've got very little obligations. They can move away and that's it. Or, um, uh, well, they can go broke and we don't have financial responsibility for them. Um, and that's actually a really weird kind of relation, but it's what, what enables our lives today. Um, this limited liability uh, uh, relationships. Anyway, this concept is hugely cited in sociology and social theory, but for some reason has never really transpired into archaeology. But I think that it should. What could it do for us? Well, apart from sanitation, education, public order on the roads, I think that it could allow us... Uh, it, it's important because it allows social navigation and information search. It's important in that it integrates large groups. It's the foundation of what sociologists call social capital and trust. Um, it's, the, it's actually sort of the, the stuff of trust. If you, if you uh, uh, what's called general social trust is actually trust in strangers, trust in people you don't know, and that's what enables societies like our own to be. And I think that it's actually a pretty good expression of the archaeological problem that we just called heterogeneity. How is it that if you were to look for weak ties in the archaeological record, I believe you would be looking for things like this, cross-cultural interaction, long-distance exchange, craft collaboration, division of labor, and settlement regulation. And these are exactly more or less the things that people have associated with urbanism. And I want to, to propose that perhaps we should see them more generally as expressions of heterogeneity and weak ties. And in this way, we could reformulate the... Uh, the um, uh, what we have called urban uh, societies, such have been tended to be defined either in terms of, well, Wirt, Wirt saw them as, uh, saw urban societies as societies that were characterized by weakened ties altogether. People did not have meaningful close social relations to their, uh, the people they lived with. Or alternatively, if we go into Weber, Max Weber's tradition, he saw them uh, saw urban societies as characterized by something like kinship ties, but not kinship, some things that have been uh, sworn by oath or fraternities and so. In between that, I think we're missing a third a crucial definition of what we're looking at, and that's the weak tie uh, definition that we could uh, base on Grano Ritter. Um, so, uh, to sum that up, I think we need to move beyond the state narratives, and we could do so by looking at social networks. Uh, to do so, we need to look at social heterogeneity, heterogeneity as our subject of study, not as an essential study, not urbanism. Urbanism as an expression of social heterogeneity rather than the other way around. And we need to put uh, the urban anom anomalies and places that are not urban back into focus in our study. Uh, and this way, I think we could uh, create an archaeology of the organization of weak ties and integration of strangers as a key parameter of society's trust and social capital. Thank you very much.